All right, folks, um, a little technical difficulty. Um, I am so excited about today's chat, so I hope we can, um, I can get Duran back in here. Um, yeah, let's see. Hey. Yeah, I'm in the place to be. Yeah. Good morning. Good afternoon. What's going on, sis? Peace, man. It's good to see you again. Good to see your face as well. Yeah, man. Yeah. I'm yeah. so. I'm. I'm. I'm your part. Say again. I said thank you for inviting me to be a part. Of course, of course. Um. So, okay. This is week twelve, and sort of once. Once we sort of we were in the midst of Corona and we were just sort of thinking about what we thought folks needed to hear. Um, Mondays became Afropunk's kind of food day. And I started these conversations in a collaboration with Black Food folks because our platform is really all about sort of food people and food adjacent folks um, sort of connecting with one another. And just felt like a really, um, a really thoughtful way to just keep us all sane in the midst of all of this. And so, like I said, week 12, we've had some really amazing conversations, mainly with folks who are doing very entrenched work around food justice, food sovereignty, and the like, right? And your name is certainly one that was always top, like first on the list to think about because there's something really particular about how you frame your work that I find fascinating. And yeah, I just, you, you have such a sober, but joyful way of thinking about your work um, and thinking about how to get people invested in the notion of real sovereignty and real liberation um, through the land. And so, I w first of all, just thank you again, but I would love it if you could start with just your good old origin story because you're a child of Richmond, you are staying in Richmond to do the work you do, um, and it seems like a really particular way of um, of navigating because I mean you could easily have been in larger cities you could easily do work that is not um so I don't know community yeah. driven in a way that requires those kinds of resources that are limited yeah yeah um well you know I'm a native Richmonder I'm, I'm from Virginia uh, I'm born in Richmond uh raised in Richmond my family legacy is in Richmond um so you know I'm rooted here I got family here my children are here you know, my mom, my sister, my brothers, my aunts, my uncles, you know, my grandparents, you know, great grandparents, everybody's here. So I'm, I'm, I'm rooted in the city in terms of this work. Um, I got into uh, this work uh, as a, a community organizer, activist, um, by virtue of um, uh, working at the Black History Museum and Culture Center of Virginia. You know, I worked there. I, I actually volunteered there for a year and begged them for a job and they actually gave me the job. And while I was there, I started this festival called Happily Natural Day um, that is uh, dedicated to cultural awareness, identity, holistic health and wellness and social change. So it was always framed around, you know, loving ourselves as people of African ancestry, but it was through organizing the festival that I met African American farmers, right? And those black farmers became, you know, my my elders, you know what I mean? And they, they, they took me under the wing. Um, I would say that uh, one of the uh, brothers, his name is Renard Turner, brother, uh, or we, as we call him, Baba Azibo. He's a black homesteader here in um, uh, Virginia and uh, out of Char close to Charlottesville. And he would call me on the phone and be talking about food security and, um, you know, one of his questions would be like, what would you do if the grocery stores close? And this for me, I'm, I'm like in my early 20s when he's asking me these questions, mm -hmm. I wasn't really ready for that type of, you know what I mean, discourse. Uh, but as I, you know, kept doing work in community, we started building collaborations. Um, one of the first forays into food system work for me was organizing the Richmond Noir Market, which was a pop-up farmer's market where we would connect black farmers to uh, communities that didn't have access to healthy food. And we would sell produce, 20 pounds of produce for $20. Um, you know, at the time I was working for social services. So I'd be promoting, you know, the program while, you know, helping people get food stamps and Medicaid and cash assistance or what have you. Uh, but every Saturday, 
every Saturday during the summer, I'd be sitting with a farmer in the hood talking about, you know, how food is grown, you know, their war, their Vietnam war experience, you know, um, when the plant, when the harvest, GMOs, hybrids, like the whole thing, I was getting this de facto, you know, education sitting at, the yeah. at, at these, at these men that were old enough to be my grandfather. So, um, what what was happening with me is that uh, I started feeling guilty. I started feeling like, man, here's this brother who's 65, almost 70 years old, who's bringing 400, 500 pounds of produce into the hood every weekend, and I'm helping him sell it with SNAP and all this type of stuff. But if something happens to him, you know what I mean, where you know he can't do this anymore, then our program goes to shit. So... Um, <laughs> You know, in 2000, I started doing the noir market in 2008. And so in 2012, I started my first community garden, uh, mm -hmm. kind of based off of that impetus, right? And um, from there, you know, we started, uh, we started first community garden. Then I started collaborating with my brother with an with a organization called Renew Richmond. And from there, we started doing other school gardens. I, I built a school garden at my old high school, the high school I graduated from, mm -hmm. you know, turned around. And um, we started doing orchards, other community gardens, graduated to urban farms. I then turned around and got a job as project director for Virginia State University's Harding Street Urban Ag Center, where I led the conversion of an old YMCA um, into an indoor farm, solar power on the roof, aquaponics on the gym floor, hydroponics, aeroponics, um, commercial kitchen in the back, mini farms, orchards, vineyards, composting stations on the vacant lots in proximity to that. And, you know, from there, it's just, you know, that was like 2014. So now yeah. we are here six years later, you know, we're still rocking and rolling, still doing Happily Natural Day, but we folded all of our urban ag work and food justice work as well as the climate resiliency work underneath uh, the Happily Natural Day. Um, in between 2016 and now, um, I worked as the, botan as the community engagement manager for uh, Lewis Ginner Botanical Garden, which is one of the top mm -hmm. botanical gardens in the country. Uh, but yeah. they laid me off due to COVID. So um, well, part, of my, yeah. part, of my <laughs> part of my narrative of resiliency is I took my last check and uh, made Happily Natural Day a nonprofit. And um, we're out here delivering, you know, uh, work to communities, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit more. So, yeah, that's that's my origin story. You know, I, I, love it. I came organically into this work. You know what I mean? Uh, elders embraced me. My The first organization that I was a part of was the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, founded by Marcus Mazai mm -hmm. Garvey. I was in chap division four, five, six. Uh, the Gabriel Pro the Gabriel Prosser, uh, the Prosser Truth Division here in Richmond. So that was the first organization that I ever joined. And the elders that embraced me from Atlanta to Harlem, you know, really expanded, you know, my uh, network of yeah. brothers and sisters that uh, have been doing this work, you know, even before I stepped into the room, but they, they provided me with inspiration. So, you know, I'm a child of the movement, man. I've been doing this since I was 22. I'm 40 years old this year. That's right. There's something I really I find um, fascinating about hearing your story multiple times because, if, again, if you all are unfamiliar with Duran, please Google him, go to his website, check out his TED Talk. But just the work that you do is so specific. Like, it, it's not just a generalized, you know, we see a, a large problem that needs theoretical solutions. It's sort of how do you activate legitimate community-based resources to attack specific issues. I wonder about your, your time with social services because I think sometimes we there's something really particular about the way the government thinks about community-based problems, especially in black and brown communities and the way they think they're being helpful and the sort of juxtaposition with what you were finding out and learning from elders juxtaposed with what your day-to-day -day job was. I wonder about that, that push-pull. For social services for um, for five years, uh, mm. I was I was intake, so I was the first person that you would see, you know, if you apply for uh, for benefits. So um, you know, my work there was basically like, you know, every 
type of person that you can imagine that would ever need services, I engage with them. Uh, you know, the city bureaucracy is very heavy, man. It's a big machine, you know what I mean? And these, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, social benefit uh, programs like SNAP uh, or food stamps or like Medicaid or like TANF, like there's an actual person that you have to interface with that you will interface with if you ever try to apply for that stuff. Um, so on the top level, you know, they just administrate this stuff. But on the bottom level, like the people that are working are like one check away from being on the opposite side of the table, man. A lot of times people are not making any money. You know, they're like, I, when I worked there, I made, I think the peak salary I got was like 35, you know, thousand with three kids, you know, so we was, you know what I mean? It was, it was a, it was a struggle at times. It's like, yo, I wish I could get some food stamps. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, talk, absolutely. But, you know, I mean, we were just beyond the thing. But I think, um, you know, the struggles that I experienced there was that these are very uh, old, archaic kind of systems. And, and they don't maneuver nimbly, you know, when it comes to responding to community issues. Uh, it's a lot of people. I mean, in Richmond, Virginia, there's uh, 250,000 people. Uh, so when you talk about new programs or altering programs, you have to think about there's, you know, multiple locations, there's hundreds of employees, you know, somebody had to craft a policy, then people got to get trained, all that stuff is just, you know, it's, 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 it's almost an insurmountable task to try to get a new program put in. I, I remember being there. And, you know, when we started doing the, uh, the, the program, the uh, 20 for 20, uh, you know, I, I had to be like, yo, man, I'm trying to get the word out about this because people can benefit off of getting 20 pounds of produce on their food stamp card, right? And it was like all of this bureaucracy just to try to get people flyers. So I was on the low, you know what I mean? Distributing, you know, my little uh, marketing materials about the program. And then I remember we tried to propose uh, there being a uh, community garden uh, started uh, by so social services. And it was just you know, it was a lot to, to, to kind of go through with even trying to pitch that type of stuff to mm -hmm. the people. Uh, so, you know, now, it, I mean, this was back in 2011, 12, you know, now we'll probably be way more amenable because of all the stuff that's going on. Right. But, you know, just people not having the vision or just having, uh, you know, those wheels not being greased enough or just the, the machine being so you know, slow to maneuver and, and, and make a sh make a, a turn. Like, you know, government agencies don't make sharp turns, which is, no. and, they're not, and they're not built for getting to the root of problems either. You know, in Richmond, uh, there is a new uh, department called the Office of Community Wealth Building that we were uh, participatory in helping to, you know, organize to get ha make happen. We did a lot of anti-poverty uh, uh, advocacy, yeah. you know, educating people about concentrated poverty and redlining in the city and that work evolved into the development of the uh, office community wealth, wealth building, which is a government department. But again, even with that, that took a long time to create, you know what I'm saying? And now that it's here, it still has, you know what I mean? It still has refinement that it needs to undergo to really meet the needs of the people. So, um, you know, I, how, how old is it? It is probably about four or five years old. Okay. Yeah. It's, I, I was not even, it's not even not even ten years old yet. So, yeah. I, you know, that's the I, type of thing to do it. Well, because I was thinking about that. I was asking about that because I was thinking about Shakira Simley, um, out of San Francisco. And she's the director of the Department of Racial Equity for the city of San Francisco. And so it's, it's it feels very similar to this notion of like essentially community based folks seeing problems and sort of encouraging city government to sort of be more thoughtful about what that what those shifts could look like and so i'm wondering about i mean i don't i want us to sort of pivot from sort of systems that are kind of broken because so much of your work is about essentially subverting those systems but i guess i'm wondering about what on the opposite side of that bureaucracy um you could you think about in terms of the way people can actually activate those some of those resources because it feels sometimes like when we have these, like, I mean, people as fierce as you, folks who are doing this very sort of spiritual, sort of community entrenched work, 
it, the feeling is that you are completely disregarding the resources of bureaucracies. Nah, and it nah. feels like you are on the other side of it, really sort of navigating them more thoughtfully and sort of activating those resources more effectively. So, so for me, what my, my, my experience has been is that, you know, we got to play Robin Hood, you know, to these structures, right? Um, these structures, you know, we pay taxes, you know, sales tax, you know, uh, city tax, you know, state tax. So, you know, if there's ways that you could subvert, you know, the system and uh, uh, acquire resources for community in that, you know, do it. It's tough. It's hard. It's not, it's not an easy world to walk. You know, some of us are more skilled in being able to walk between those two dimensions, you know, and be them all, their authentic selves. Me, I, I, my work, um, because I came into this work fully myself, and when I walked into social services, I was fully myself, and I had my community work that ex that existed before I even walked into, you know, that 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 job. When I got into that job, I brought my community work with me. So I already had, you know, capacity. I already had my own resume track record. So what I did when I was in those spaces, you know, I you know used my access point by being a city employee in combination with my community work. And I, I you know, I walked into those advocacy rooms, those work groups, those policy task force using my 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 appellation as a as a benefits program specialist and a community organizer to my advantage you know and to the advantage of the work now um uh, i will say you know it is you know it's it requires patience man that stuff is yeah. hard i mean and when i say it's hard it's hard on you psychologically because you got people that will try to tone police you you got people that will try to like you know negate your 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 knowledge and your skills and abilities you know because you you know might not have a master's degree in this or that or whatever but you know my my resume is I was built by the streets you know I came from uh the south side of Richmond you know I grew up in the city I grew up in the parts of town that people don't go so I brought all that experience with me and the relationships that I built, you know, were intrinsic and built off of people trusting my work based off of what they see me do in the community. And so if you yeah. got that capacity to be able to walk those two dimensions, you know, you need a, a round of applause because those people are rare. You know what I'm saying? People that know how to communicate the issues of community but are in the boardroom, you know what I mean, and can keep their soul and not, you know, be sold out or sell out you know, to the to the to, mm. that, to that to that system. So I mean, I knew when I went in that room, I knew what I wanted. I knew what I came to get. You know, what I'm saying I knew what I wasn't going to compromise. And because of that, we were able to really, you know, help move some things forward. I mean, I was on the food policy task force. I was on the anti poverty task force while I was working for the city. And now that I'm not with the city, you know what I'm saying? Like those people that work for the city remember the input and the contributions that we made. So when we make collaborations and when we, you know, try to build new programs, like right now, for example, like the city council people for one of the districts in our city is, is looking to do some urban ag stuff. So they know our work. And so they reach out to us, you know what I'm saying? And we like, all right, boom, this is what we're going to do. We're going to build X, Y, Z and community. Um, and then also, you know, we haven't been afraid to ring the alarm when some BS was going down. That's so right. you know, when we ring the alarm, we're ringing the alarm based off of being in this work for years. It's not like we just knew to the block, you know, people see us and like, yo, this, they knew what they talking about. If they call it BS, then, you know, it's some BS. It ain't no personal. Sh it ain't, you know, us just trying yeah. to like be performative with the cancel culture or anything like that. We had a lady who was working for um, the community garden department for the city. And uh, she was, she was, she was, um, she had some bigoted perspectives, you know what I mean? And so we had to, we had to take her to task, you know what I mean? We had to put her on blast and get her on up out of that jank, you know what I'm saying? So, that's you right. know, what people but see. But that's also the work as well, right? Like, that's, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I say all that to say, like, you know, I, I'm not the person, like, in this era right now of, like, Black Lives Matter and protesting city government, people, people are, 
are more than willing to cap to isolate the entire city government and toss it to the side because they're not responding the way they want them to respond. But the reality is, is like we've been at, if you are, that there's a value of being able to insert yourself into that space, right? And build the relationship that is required to get ish done. You know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm the type of person that's like, yo, you know, I'll eat the meat and throw away the bone. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm not, I don't, I don't expect the government official to, you know, have everything perfect, you know, in terms of what, you know, is going on in the city because, you know, it takes a certain type of person to even work in those spaces, you know what I mean? And compromise with, you know, all this type of stuff. But, you know, I will take the meat when it's time to take the meat and make it do what it's supposed to do and understand that the government is not the, uh, there's a lot more, there's a lot of work that we can do direct action in our own communities that doesn't require the government involvement at all. And so that's where my work starts is like, what can I, what can we do that doesn't require, you know, city involvement? Like if there's a policy that needs to be changed, Oh, we know how to change the policy. Let's change the policy. Like we ain't going to spend a whole lot of time raggling and scrambling and screaming and yelling. The policy gets changed because you advocate to the city council people and their aides. They draft the legislation, right? They present it, right? And then it gets voted on. Like you can spend a whole lot of time spinning your wheels in other directions, but if you want to get the policy changed, then there's a pot process for doing that. And I've been more, we've been more unhappy to engage that process to get policies changed when they needed to be changed. But you know, I don't know. I, no, like I but don't you? I don't know. This I want because I want to circle back to a point you made really early on, where you talked about sort of the the example of elders. Um, I think a lot about intergenerational conversation that we don't tend to have. Sometimes I think this in this moment of sort of transformation in terms of like activism, a lot of folks are coming newly to the space of being feeling politically activated to you know sort of affect change where they are, right? This sort of sense that you could literally affect massive change with very small, specific, intentional movement. And I guess I'm thinking a lot about what, one of the most beautiful things, I mean, I've heard you speak a ton and, you know, sort of, but you gave a speech um, honoring Shirley and Charles Sherrod last year mm. um, at Firefly on Fork. And there was something really poignant in what, and if any of you go to my page, um, I mean, um, Black Kone, I have a, I have a clip of Duran honoring um, Mr. and Mrs. Sherrod, but there was something really particular in that speech that you talked about with reference to what work looks like, what, what the work looks like, and sort of how, like, lifting them up as examples of what that has looked like in their generation is sort of almost this the time passed that you sort of accepted. So I guess I wonder if you could just really talk a little bit more about um, the Shirai, certainly, but um, yeah. what that intergenerational conversation is looking like in this moment, especially in the midst of like this the pandemic and just what this moment requires. Yo, that's a great question. Um, so for so for me, man, I honor. I'm, I, I give. I, I'm a child of the movement that was embraced by elders, right? I didn't jump off the porch. You know, what I'm saying, trying to do something in community without that guidance, right? So from, you know, D.C. to Atlanta to Richmond, like I have a circle of elders that I answer to that I feel responsible and accountable unto, right? So in this work. Um, and Shirley Sherrod and, and Charles Sherrod, while I had never met them before, I consider them, you know, elder statesmen in this work. And so when I look at their, I look at their, their, their longitudinal history in this work, I see growth, I see evolution, right? And I take those lessons for myself. Like, yo, it's like the work might look like one thing one day, right? So so today it might look like, you know, protesting and getting statues knocked down. But staying consistent in the work is what, for for me, what is more valuable than even the Resora, you know, uh, uh, compound that the Shiraz have developed with uh, new communities. I mean, the fact that they can trace their lineage in this work to SNCC, right, and move it all the way forward to 2020 with consistent, dedicated energy 
right? That did not, it did not always look the same way, but it was always for the same purpose of free, getting our people freedom, right? And, those, and, what, and what pieces and tools that were used shifted and evolved over time. But it's st- the, the goal stayed the same. And that's, that's what right. I think was important for at the, uh, activists today to understand. It's like, yo, the tools shift. You can't, you know, every, I, if, you, if, you, if you don't know how to build a house, then the hammer is the only tool that you're going, you know, you're going to use a hammer to try to cut wood. But the reality is, is like there's specific tools for specific aspects of the work. You know what I mean? And you can't be mad because the hammer don't work right now. It's like, yo, the hammer don't work, bro. Like, let's pick up this bandsaw. The bandsaw <laughs> is much better applied in this particular situation that we're in. But the way that young folks engage in the work, they haven't studied. And a lot of times that, that's, that causes problems, not only for the movement, but for themselves because you get burnt out and you'll lose the vigor and you'll lose the energy because you're trying to bang a bang you know, nails where you should be cutting wood. You know what I'm saying? And that's, and that's the try. And that's the, I mean, I, I had to learn that the hard way myself. Like I had to realize like, yo, every situation doesn't require me to do the same thing. Right. So I started out running a festival. Right. But it was a time when I had to go out and put a sign up, you know what I'm saying? And I had to be the only person in the crowd with a sign. Right. And that moved the thing in a certain direction. Right. Uh, there was a time when I had to be like, all right, let me be the diplomat and engage in dialogue with these people and develop these relationships. And I did that too. And then there was another time when I had to call bullshit on the same people for the shit that they was doing. So it's like, yo, you got to always be nimble. And that's my experience. It's like being nimble and being willing to evolve and be like water. Like Bruce, Bruce Lee's birthday, man. The, 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 it's the, uh, we're on the eve of his birthday. So be like water, man. Like be nimble, be fluid, and understand like it's the conditions that will determine what tools you need to use. You don't get to determine what tools you need to use. You got to evaluate the situation appropriately and maneuver accordingly. But, you know, as far as intergenerational work, you learn that when you build with your elders, when you really sit down at their feet, yeah. right, and stop and don't castigate them. I mean, that whole thing, like, like, we are not our ancestors, like that. I mean, that's such a disrespect to the intergenerational nature of this work. Like, I can't, I would not be where I'm at, where if I had not listened to my to my elders. But I will say this: there were points when I didn't listen to my elders, and then years later, I was like, God damn it, if I had to just listen to what they were trying to tell me, you know what I'm yes. saying? Or at least took heed, then I would have been, adva- I would have advanced even quicker in terms of the work. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, pe- these old heads, they not telling you something just for the sake of telling you. They trying to give you some insight based off of their lived experience and based on their observation of the conditions, which have not changed. It's not like we're dealing with that new part. phenomenon. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is the same phenomenon from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s so when I hear Daruba Ben Wahad, former political prisoner, right, ex Black Panther, tell me some real shit, I'm gonna listen to him because he yeah. knows what the fuck he's talking about. It's not like he's just talking to hear himself talk. He's giving a, an analysis that's asserted. This man old enough to be my grandfather. So why right. what I look like just starting to organize and not paying attention to what he got to say? That's that's this, mm-hmm. that's the that's the reality of this stuff, man. You know what I'm saying? So why mm-hmm. so I got into the food work because of the elders, because of older heads that was like give, they didn't tell me to farm, but when I started seeing what they was doing, I started putting together shit. I was like, yo, man, this brother is 75 years old moving 400 pounds of produce on a Saturday. Mm. Like, and here I am, 25 years old, you know what I'm saying, trying to sell some produce like why am I not engaging in this work? Like, what's what, what? What is what am I doing? Like, I mean, this is great, this little piece of the puzzle, but there's something bigger to it than this. And he's this this uh, this elder statesman that when he shakes my hand, like he shakes my hand, not like you know no flimsy handshake, like no. it's like you know, rough, like you can feel the work and experience inside of that handshake. It's like yo, this is where I want to be when I'm in my seventies. I want to be able to work with younger people. You know what I mean? And pass the baton and give them game. 
So anyway. That's right. Like, just guess. I guess. All of that. Um, I am really interested in... So, again, but going back, you, sh- I, I just, you need to, I need to, like, connect you with Shakira directly, because y'all are so sympathetic in terms of the way you think of the world, the way you navigate the world, but she was talking a lot about the city's response to COVID and how all of a sudden there were all these resources just, you know, like, part of it is this is the federal government, but just, uh, there were so many innovative and, like, practical ways that the city became activated in the midst of COVID. Mm-hmm. And her, she was saying it like she feels the work now, or her work in, inside the system, is essentially to sort of keep those resources flowing. Um, because some of those things, some of those services were necessary before this moment and will Third. be necessary after it. Most so I guess I'm wondering about what it's been like in Richmond. Like what what yeah. has, because I mean, I, I feel like your work is more important now than ever, but just sort of what are you saying in terms of so... the good things and so with the COVID, you know, just like many other cities, you know, it's black and brown people that were getting hit the worst um, mm-hmm. in terms of it. Um, but I did watch the city pivot, you know, and shift. You know, they came up with a whole website dedicated to mutual aid. You know, you can go onto the website and connect with people to where food was, you know, if you need to help with rent, you know, et cetera. Um, the, 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 the mayor, you know, was really has really been trying to figure out what to do about this eviction, this this pending eviction crisis, you know, but it's it's all by by parts. It's all in part supported by folks that are doing work in that in 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 in, in the community. Um, mm. What I will say is, um, this is the time for collaboration. You know what I'm saying? This is it's nothing like a good crisis to make people realize that yo, we should have been working together. You know what I'm saying? And I think that this situation has made administrators on the city level realize that there's some uh, dots that need to be connected, right? Uh, so in the city, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the testing uh, spaces started to come online and in communities of color, specifically, uh, the school board reached out to uh, uh, started doing uh, food delivery and things like that. They reached out to us and was like, yo, how can we support your uh, uh, raised bed, our resiliency garden project, which was dope. I was like, oh yeah, and uh, and it was great too. I mean, the mayor even donated to our fund- fundraising campaign, which I thought was amazing. Okay. Right? So in the light, but but at the same time, I you know we got to hold their feet to the fire. They was they was you know really not the best responders when the when the protests started happening, you know. And so yeah. it's really sad to watch the police response and the city response, but it's kind of like. You know, I had to challenge some people to like, you know, we have a black mayor, we got majority black city council. I was like, so at the end of the day, you know, police brutality is a manifestation of white supremacy. So even if you got a black mayor, you know what I mean? Does the black mayor really control the city? You know what I'm saying? Like, does he have that power? Does his power, does the black mayor's power trump white supremacy? And the and the, and the answer to that question is obviously no. You know, right. I mean, this shit is out of his control. So, you know, this is bigger than him, bigger than, you know, a city government or what have you. Right. So I'll, I'll say all I have to say, uh, you know, this is a, a really prime opportunity for folks to figure out alternative systems and figure out how to connect those dots with their city council people, you know what I mean, with their city mm-hmm. council aides, because they're all out here trying to figure out, okay, well, what do we need to do? I mean, I was on yep. a Zoom call with um, one of the uh, city council people, and I was like, yo, y'all talk about defund the police. We need to be talking about asset forfeiture, right? So when the police arrest somebody on whatever level and they take your assets, they keep that shit. You know what I'm saying? And they use that to fund, you know, munitions, weapons, trainings, and all that type of stuff. But there's no accountability to that money going back into the community. So I was like, yo, we need to look at how much money is coming through asset forfeiture and how do we get that money and put that back into the community? You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's deep, but the, uh, but the window is wide open, you know, especially if you're doing food advocacy, if you're doing food justice work, like, yo, there's no better time to be engaging with your municipal government about this shit. I mean, we talking about climate resiliency, you know, it's the heat of the summer. You know what I mean? We talk about droughts. 
urban heat island effect, you know, people not having access to food, people being, you know, laid off from work, being immunocompromised. This is the time to be like, okay, we have a solution. We just need resources in order to make the solution scale. You know what I mean? But, but you got to be willing to even have that conversation. Like, you can't be in there like, you know, fuck the mayor and then be asking him, you know, how can you support this people's program? That they don't, those two, <laughs> those, those two realities don't coexist. So you got to be willing to be able to be an emissary and figure out how do you, again, Robin Hood the resources into community because they want to they want to impact the community in a positive way like the city is not you know the mayors and the city councilmen are not trying to kill their citizen that's not real they at the best you know they they might not give a fuck about them like on a on an intrinsic level but <clears throat> that's when you can call bs and 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 put them on blast and make sure that they allocate those resources accordingly but for the most part especially if you're in a majority black city you know what I mean, with majority black government and leadership, you have an opportunity to develop a collaboration with them that will shift things in your reality on a, on, on a, on a real level. And I can attest, that's what's been happening with us. We, you know, we got funding from the city because we had consistent work to showcase. It wasn't right. like we just had an idea. It's like, yo, here's the, here's the, you know, here's the receipts of what we've been doing. So, you know, when they came up, it was like, hey, you know, he, we give you $2,000 to go do X, Y, Z. Or do you need access for water at the, at the community gardens and green spaces? Do you need soil? What is it that you need? We were able to run a list down and be like, all right, this is what we need. Yeah. You know I mean? But you got to be what you got in this moment. You got to be willing to have that dialogue in order to really secure the bag and change the policies so that when this stuff is over, you know, our communities will have more power. I think the challenge is that people don't really know, they're not really defining what power looks like for the community. Oh, that's a good one. That's, yeah, that's that's you know a big saying? part. Right? That's the major issue. Um, not really being able to be clear about what you really need or want. And right. I don't know, because it's, it's this thing about um, sort of looking at sort of savior nonprofits or government spaces that don't really sort of connect directly with the community they're trying to engage now i actually ask them what folks need but you it's like one of the things like you can't really ask like you can't get what you need if you don't know what to ask for um right. i don't know yeah somebody asked a question earlier um and i don't know if you want to if you saw it or want to circle back to it but it was sort of about um the intergenerational conversation so circling back to that and we're talking about like the examples essentially of like really great elders who you're talking about um but also maybe tension or push pull that you find that you may have found um with elders maybe even in city government that yeah. don't see the that are beholden to old models that don't necessarily serve the moment that we're in. And while, yeah. but I don't know, I just wondered about what you, what yeah. you know, I've, I've dealt with that. I've dealt with that. So, I mean, so this is so that, so every generation, like my mom always told me that her job was to raise us so that we do better than her. You hmm. know what I'm saying? And so, you know, I always look at it like, all right, the younger generation that's coming up is supposed to push the needle forward further, right? So, yeah. you know, oftentimes, you know, especially in like Bible Belt cities, we deal with, you know, black uh, people who like to accommodate, you know what I'm saying, uh, the system in many ways. So they, they are challenged with really pushing for radical root cause issues because, you know, they're really invested in the comfortability of white people or the status quo, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, all I can say is that uh, I've had some run-ins with elders that were not as productive as I would like. And, you know, I always take it as uh, what uh, uh, Daru will call struggle. Like those crit that criticism, you know, that, that, that back and forth, that dialogue, you know, sometimes it, re it requires people to have to do some in in uh, internal reflection. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like, what is it? So I'll use, let me bring it down to, to earth, right? So I had a, I had an elder, an older, uh, let me, let me be clear. I had an older brother, right? Who was in the uh, nonprofit space, right? 
he worked for one of the foundations, right? A uh, major foundation. The, the folks, you know, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna put them on blast right now, but they had. There was a family foundation, right? So uh, we were cri we were criticizing the education funding at one point, right? So the education funding situation for the city was was struggled. You know, it's always a struggle, right? Um, but we brought up the contradiction that if philanthropy wanted to drop you know what I'm saying, the money to meet the budget for the schools, they could, right? If they, I mean, if they wanted to make a decision to drop the money, they could drop the money because they, you know, they're dropping money everywhere, right? So um, the, the brother, the brother called me, man, and, and and was like, yeah, you know, you you know, you can't say that. And I was like, what? You trying to tone police me? And so then he was like, um, he wanted to meet with me, right? But then on the top of meeting with me. He wanted to when this is when I was working for the botanical garden. He wanted to meet with my white executive director, right? Too. So all of us at the same time. So it was really a weird thing. And he brought up. He's like, man, y'all got some grants in the queue. You know, you saying this stuff on? I was like, yo, me and my personal tweaks and perspectives should have nothing to do with any grant review or evaluation or you know application that we have pending. Like my my assessment of the system should not intervene with that in any way. And then for you to try to call my white boss to try to check me, I was like, this is some bullshit, right? So, but anyway, you know, we in there, we went into the meeting and I had to sit down, you know, my, 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 my executive director at the time, you know, this black man and another staff person from the foundation. So he him and haw and he like, yeah, you know, to run, you know, he's well respected. He's saying these things and, you know, we just trying to make sure that, you know, you know, a lot of people listen to him and da 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 and da, da 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 He was basically like, you know, tell your boy that works for you to watch what he say. And so my executive <laughs> director was like, yo, I'm a white man from Montana. What I look like telling this black man from Richmond, Virginia, what he can and cannot say, right? So it was an immediate, like, <sighs> it blew the room away because here's he expected the white people to try to put me on a leash, right? And so, you know, that 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 example is one of where, you know, the fragility and comfortability of white people were was being acquiesced unto by this black man who felt like my words would, you know what I mean, upset them in some way. Right. And 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 that and that type of phenomenon exists, you know, in our you know, across the spectrum. Because, you know, Especially in these in these Bible Belt cities, it's like we live in under under oppression, and it's like this internal oppression permeates inside of us as well. So we kind of sometimes be afraid to make the white folks uncomfortable because we fear like those white folks will take their resources away from us if we you know disturb them too much. So my thing is like if I got if you feel like you know me saying that white supremacy is a problem and philanthropy could solve you know, a problem by putting resources in the community. If that's offensive, I don't want your money. You know what I'm saying? Because this is not the relationship that is really going to free the community because, you know, white folks have just as much internalized uh, uh, white supremacy as we have internalized oppression. So the change that needs to happen is like, you know, we got to get over this accommodationist, you know, kind of upholding the status quo tone policing, respectability, politics stuff. So that's what I've experienced with elders at times. And then also, you know, there's other kind of like things where it's like cliques, you know, we got certain spaces where there is like bourgeoisie blacks, where it's like, you know, certain organization you got to be a part of, or, you know, you got to be, have pledged a certain thing in order for, you know, that support to come, which is all weird, but it's, I mean, it's a part of, you know, it's a part of the narrative. We can't, we, can't, <laughs> we got to be real about it. It's like, if I'm not a alpha or I'm not a whatever, then it's, you know, it's a different type of support that you get. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it's all good. That's something that I think we'll grow out of. I do too. I think, I, I feel like there's something you hit on that I'm really sitting with. And that's sort of, <laughs> you, and I, I've heard you say it before, but you, you talked earlier about, um, sort of moving the needle and being 
like being charged with moving the needle in your own way. Like it doesn't negate the the struggle, the sort of lessons, and it. But it, it so it takes those on board and requires you to really see and be beholden to the movement and the work you're doing. Right? Like it's it can't be this 1960s. It can't be the 1980s. It can't. It, it, we, we you can learn from those those moments and those elders and those. But we, it has to be of the moment, and it's got to be like through your own lens in that way. So mm -hmm. I feel like that question was really great because I think it also talked a lot about, um, sometimes I think, and I don't know whether it's a, 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 an affectation of age, but I don't know if you, I don't know if you feel, and we're about the same age, it's this feeling of like coming to, coming of age or coming to a point in your life where you are seeing, seeing all the past. Um, you also sort of, at the age where you are taking maybe more seriously than you may have been in your twenties, but it's always been kind of converging in a way that um, makes you more—I don't know—makes you more prepared to really lead. Um, I think. It, I think. I think you're. I think what you're alluding to is just like you know that chiseling that happens as a result of doing the work on a yeah. consistent basis. It's like, it, you know, this work is personal, man. So you know me. I always say people, tell people, like, me starting Happily Naturally, they grew me up as a man, right? I've been doing it for 18 years, you know what I'm saying? I got two kids. I got three kids. My, my oldest is 17. My youngest mm -hmm. is 10, you know what I'm saying? So I, the, before I had children, I, I've been organizing the community. So I can't, I can't do the same type of work that I was doing when I was, you know what I'm saying, 22, 23, Right? I was 23, 24, I could be out everywhere. I could hit up all the open mics and be at every rally and, you know what I'm saying, doing all the workshops and everything. I had the energy for that. You know what I'm saying? But as I turned 31, 32, 33, I had to shift and become way more refined in how I spent my time because I have a family, right? And that's yeah. my first priority. And now as I turn 40, my game is like, yo, I, I can't be out here farming every site in the Richmond region, like what I look like. So now I'm about that training life. Like, how can I train people and show them how to do how to get this popping? You know what I'm saying? In their own communities and support them, and you know what I mean, the resilience of of the work that they're doing. So all of that has come by virtue of just like, you know, being in it and 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 seeing for myself, like, okay, well, how does this work with me as a person, as a human being? Like, I can't deny my children time. Like, I can't be like, yo, I got to farm five sites, so I can't take you to putt-putt. You know what I'm saying? I can't go go-kart racing with you because I got this protest to go to. Like, that is not healthy as a father. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. you know, I got to, you got to evolve and shift as you age and as you grow. And so I respect, that's, that's why I respect my elders so much because I see what they did with me, right? When I was in my 20s, there was a woman that was in her almost fifties that said, "Hey, young buck, you need to join the UNIA." You know, what I'm saying? <laughs> and put me on, and you know what I mean. She supported me in my work. I remember right. when we were doing Happily National Day, she she couldn't organize all that stuff and lift tables, but she printed me posters. You know what I'm saying? She printed me out flyers. You know what I mean? She helped me with you know what I mean stuff that she could help me with, and that's how that's the type of you know, logistics in our community that are often underestimated. It's like, you know, everybody don't got to be at the protests in order for them to be valuable to the work. Like, I can't tell you how many times, I, I have diabetes, right? So I can't go out to large crowds, you know what I'm saying? But I had people be like, well, why don't you come out to the protests? It's like, bruh, I, I've been there, done that. You know what I'm saying? That's not my lane. You know what I'm saying? I do food justice, I grow food. Right, but my 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 input and criticism of what's going on is just as valuable as if I was right there in the front taking a rubber bullet. You know what I'm saying? Because I didn't <laughs> take my fair share of police brutality in my life. So just because I ain't getting beat over the head right now, don't mean that you know what I'm saying what I got to say isn't wholesome <laughs> and isn't valuable for the movement. You know what I'm saying? So everybody got their place to roll, and especially when it comes to intergenerational spaces, I think it's more the responsibility of the young people to be open to connecting with the, uh, with the elders and seek them out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Versus like being like, Oh, the elders ain't supporting us. Like, bruh, like 
You know what I'm saying? Do you know what it's like to get out the bed at 50 years old? No, you don't. Like, I mean, come on, man. People got back yeah. problems, got arthritis. You know what I mean? People dealing with high blood pressure, di diabetes. So they can't be out there with you all the time. It's like they say that the young people are for, are, are, for, are made for war. The, uh, the elders are made, made for wild, wild, wise counsel. You know what I'm saying? So we got to be more, you know what I mean, compassionate with the way that our yeah. communities, you know what I mean, are, are built and set up. That's just my, that's just my perspective. You absolutely, no, you're absolutely right. Um, We're doing really good on time. We got about 10 minutes. I want to leave room in case people have, we've been good about sort of seeing comments that are coming in. <laughs> If anybody has any direct questions for Deron, you can ask them now. Um, there was one question about, um, I guess, someone based in Richmond. I'll put it up. Um, purple, purple People Media. Um, I guess you all, you can um, slide into Deron's DMs, but um, if people are in around Richmond, also if you if you could talk a little bit about national organizations, but people right now listening wherever they are, thinking about food sovereignty, thinking about food justice work, think, thinking about your point, your very brilliant point about movements needing all kinds of skills. And you may have some skill sets that could be helpful. Um, one, if you're in Richmond, how, how could people sort of get in touch and support? Oh, yeah. But nationally, like, what is what is what is showing up look like? What is, I, I feel like it's really interesting thing because I think people feel sometimes intimidated by movements that they don't necessarily, they aren't a part of or don't, or don't necessarily feel called to. Yeah. Oh man, um, so you know, I'm I'm a f I am I farm, right? Right. That's what I do day in, day out. You know what I'm saying? My every day is I'm growing some food. But everybody is not gonna be a farmer, right? What I learned doing this work in food systems is that there's a role for everybody in developing food systems. Everybody gotta eat. Mm. You know what I'm saying? There's nobody I, that's exempt from eating food, right? So, you know, on a bare, very basic consumer level, if you want to just support farmers, black farmers by purchasing a CSA or volunteering at their farm, you know, you are, you know, you could be a very important aspect of the, of the movement. But, you know, beyond food production, we talk about distribution, you know what I mean? So who's aggregating produce? Who's, who's running these farmers markets? Who's um, doing value added products? You know, who's proce or who's processing produce? You know, who's doing the marketing? You know, who's helping with the administration, the, the accounting? You know what I mean? Who's doing um, the community outreach or community engagement? You know, who's yeah. doing the composting? You know, all of that stuff requires people with skills, you know what I mean? And with abilities and time. So so what I realized in this work is like, you know, we want this urban agriculture or agriculture, sustainable agriculture period is one of the most intimate ways of organizing in communities because there is nobody in the community that does not have a stomach, right? So if you're figuring out a way to engage communities around them eating and having access to healthy food, this is the most intimate relationship that you might be able to have with somebody. I mean, you could talk about housing, right? But people might choose to be homeless and they still have to eat. You know what I'm saying? You might organize around you know, environmentalism, but every day, you know, people got to eat, you know, the, all this stuff is, it, it comes to like a very personal reality. So, you know, with us, Happily Natural Day, the work that we do is dedicated to, again, cultural identity, you know, holistic health and wellness and social change. And we do that through, you know, the organizing of the trainings and the festivals and, and, and working on the farms and developing farms and and helping supporting people in the development of those green spaces for both food justice and climate resiliency. And, you know, they can get at us. If you want to volunteer right now, our main work, a big part of our work is this resiliency garden project where we're delivering raised beds to community members all across the region for free. Oh. Right. So people can go on our website and request uh, a, a raised bed. And uh, this, this whole work is, is designed to make, to help people, express their agency in terms of them knowing exactly where their food comes from and being a participant in the growing of it. And ain't trying to say that the six by four raised bed is going to grow everything that you need to eat because it's not, but, it's a start. But, but it's, but it's a start and it's get and it gets you appreciative of the hands that grow your food, right? If you're growing yeah. squash and, 
you know, tomatoes and peppers, and you see what that process looks like, imagine trying to feed thousands, you know what I'm saying, on your farm. So that so it gives you a different, you know, uh, a different experience. So yeah. we're, very, we're, we're looking for volunteers for that all the time. Uh, we, we've delivered 200 raised beds, over 200 raised beds in the last three months. And we're, uh, we got probably another 200 plus that have come into the queue that we're slowly knocking down. But the more uh, hands we have on it, the more we're able to uh, respond as quickly for, uh, for folks. So we're always looking for volunteers. Um, but if you want to raise bed, reach out because, you know, if you're in the Richmond region, you know, we got about 100 or so volunteers that are uh, delivering wood, delivering raised beds, building boxes. You know, we're going 30, 40 miles outside of our Richmond proper to help, you know, connect people with these, uh, with these resources um, on top of our farming efforts, you know, on top of organizing the virtual festival, on top of having a CSA program. Uh, my partner runs uh, called the Diverse CSA, you know, keeping bees, raising chickens, like we're doing all those things. And um, the more, the more, uh, commu this is a communal work, you know, and it, it really showcases personal development too, like commitment, loyalty, time, you know, reliability, like all that stuff is manifested through the work we do on the farm. That's right. I want to be respectful of your time, and I feel like that's a really perfect place to start, but someone asked a question about CSAs and their power. Um and then, I mean, I don't know if you want to answer it now, or maybe the person could direct message you because it's a really interesting, um, I, like it's an interesting way to engage folks. Um, and I'm wondering, and it's really sort of cogent in the sort of urban farming space, and certainly um, in like the the issues you were talking around, or talking about around food security in urban spaces. Um, hold up, I lost audio. Can you, can you, is anybody here? Is anybody here? Right can y'all hear me? Okay. Uh, so CSAs, community supported agriculture. So you buying a share of uh, a farmer's harvest ahead of time with him is the ultimate way to yep. invest in local foods, right? So you are yep. supporting that farmer by putting money in his hands and then coming and, and picking up produce from him on a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis, whatever the system is. The future yep. of CSAs for us is modified, like modifying the CSA so that the so that a person is paying uh, an aff uh, affordable rate. Maybe they can spend like $20 every two weeks, but they can still get a regular delivery of, or a regular pickup of produce. So we've been practicing that since we started doing this stuff, and we're still doing that. It's, you still got to pay in advance, you know what I mean? But it's like, you know, 40 bucks every two weeks. You know, once uh, Virginia allows for us to do uh, snap purchases online, then we'll mm. be able to uh, we'll be able to accept SNAP and do the same thing that we were doing back in uh, 2008, which is the you know the the 20 pounds or 30 pounds of produce. Um, you know the CSA work is also uh, helps you understand that all produce don't have to look like what you see in the grocery store. You that know what part. I'm so it's, it's so it, it kind of helps you understand that like yo, you know this cabbage, especially if you're buying from a natural farmer or a certified naturally grown farmer or a biological farmer, you know, they might have some bite marks from a, uh, from a cabbage worm in the cabbage, but that don't mean the cabbage is bad. That just means that, you know, they didn't spray the <laughs> herbicides or per pesticides on it. And you just pick the part that you don't like off and you should be good to go. I'm not saying that quality is not an issue. I'm just saying that, you know, when you, when you participate in things like CSAs, you, you can take more of those tomato taste like. Yeah, this ain't been sitting on the, uh, in in nobody's truck for three weeks, bro. This was picked like two days ago. You yep. know what I mean? And that and that experience also forces you to have to cook. So getting a, a CSA share on a biweekly basis, like you know, I, I get I get a CSA from another farm from another farmer, right? And you know, I every two weeks, you know, cabbage, uh, carrots, uh, zucchini eggplant you know what i'm saying i even got some uh some skates once and then i was like yo what am i gonna do with these skates i hadn't cooked skates before so it mm -hmm. requires it, it, it forces you to have to like you know look up some recipes and figure out how you're gonna cook this food that you got in abundance so um mm -hmm. you know that i think a csa is ultimate man you could find farmers in your area and if the farmers in your area don't don't offer up a csa 
then you know you can always organize uh, 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 aggregation of produce from you know local farmers and start you know a CSA of your own. You know what I'm saying? That's right. So th so there's opportunities for you to be the change uh, that you want to see as well. Teron, that's perfect way to end. I love you. I appreciate you. Yo, if you are anyone who has heard Duran, I'm sure is impressed and just blown away. Please, you can follow him here on Instagram. Please, you can go to DuranChavez.com. You can follow all his amazing projects. Um, yeah, just really, I appreciate your time. Yo, thank you, Teresa. You've been amazing. I really appreciate your, clarity, your, your clear voice in this space and hosting these calls. It's fabulous, man. And I'm so glad we met, you know, with uh, Lenny a couple years ago because mm -hmm. I really think you, you know, the work that you do in terms of bringing these food narratives forward is magnificent, man. Thank you for you being you. And, 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 and thank you for inviting me on this platform to share. And I appreciate you. Of course. We have to get you over on Black Food Folks too to do this again. But I appreciate you. And yes, follow this man. Google him. Check his TED Talk and support his work. Word up. Y'all be blessed, man. Thank you. I'll see you later, y'all. Yeah. See ya. Oh, that was so good. Okay. So um, later on today, three o'clock. Um oh, thank y'all. Thank y'all so much for um for listening. This was so, so dope. Um, so later on today, over on Black Food Folks, we got um Paula Velez in conversation with um Coelho, New York City. Um a really interesting plantain-based um, chef, cookbook writer, um, and platform sort of thinking about the diaspora. So please just go over there and check it out. Um, Black for Folks all week long has lots of great um, programming. So um, this is our weekly kickoff um, today um, at noon. So join us next week. Um, next week on the 3rd, I'm going to be in conversation with Angela and June Provost. That was a conversation that was supposed to happen a couple of weeks ago. Um, we had to reschedule, but it's going to be so amazing to hear from them. So thank you all so much, and I will hopefully see you guys next week. <laughs>